Thanks for coming to Southland today. If this is your first time, we really appreciate you checking us out. Feel free to introduce yourself in the comments section. If you're a regular, as always, let us know you're here by putting your names in the comments section as well. Also, we love the pictures of our church family worshiping at home. I hope you'll upload another photo or video this morning. By the way, if you have any technical difficulties with the live stream, be sure to check out the comments section for any instructions on how you can adjust to get connected. One quick reminder, the next refuge drop-off will be Saturday, May 16th. Families in our area are still in need of help, so please bring to the church unexpired food items a week from Saturday. Again, that's May 16th between 9 and 11 a.m. You can leave them in your back seat or trunk, and our team will take them out for you. Thanks for caring for people in our community who really need it. Now the big question. You may be one of those people who are curious about when and how we will begin in-person worship services. Pastor Steve will give us an update about that in a little bit, so stay tuned. Today we want to focus on Southland's local and global mission work. We believe Jesus' last command should be our first concern. Go out and make disciples of all nations. Since that's our mission, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our guest speaker, Danny Beasley, from One Mission Society. Pastor Steve will tell you more about him during the service. Okay, we're about to get started. Our leadership team is ready, and I hope you're ready too. It's going to be a great morning. Thanks again for being part of Southland Worship, and enjoy the service. Good morning, Southland. I'm glad you're watching. I'm glad you're watching. Wherever you're at this morning, with your family or whoever you're with today, would you stand together? Let's sing this song together. Let's praise his name. Let's give him the glory that he's due.
everlasting God. Let's sing this together. Praise his name for who he is. This is straight from scripture. Strength will rise as we wait upon from Psalm 30 that I read a few weeks ago that I really want to share with you, especially with, with everything that we've been through uh, lately and just I, maybe that this whole thing is coming to the, come to end and, and maybe God is blessing us in that. Love this in Psalm 30. Scripture says this, you turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade.
impact around the country and around the world. Thanks so much for being part of our service today. Uh, today is a great celebration for us. Uh, we're, we always look forward to our local and global mission ministry and talking about that and thanking God for his help in that. And today we're gonna focus on that with our guest speaker, Danny Beasley. I wanna tell you a little bit about him in a few seconds here. But before I do that, I wanna respond and give you some information based on what the governor told us this past Friday. We are so grateful for the people of Southland and the patience you've shown and the service you've given so that our ministry would continue. You've, you've listened to us, you've listened to the government, and we're so grateful for the help that you've provided. The constant emails, uh, cards, letters even, and, and the way you've contributed faithfully, thank you for supporting us as we've walked through this journey together. Now, the governor said that he's going to reopen uh, our, our communities through five stages and that the current stage that we're in now is stage one. Tomorrow begins stage two. And in that stage two, he's saying that uh, groups of 25 or less can gather together as long as they're practicing social distancing and wearing masks and, and doing all of the things that the CDC tells us that we should be doing. But he included in that stage two that on May 8th, that would be Friday actually, worship services can begin gathering. And as I've researched it carefully, there was no number limitation on those worship services as long as those churches are practicing social distancing and the CDC guidelines. However, he did say, the governor did say, I would prefer that you continue doing services online, but we're opening up the door if churches want to have worship services. And then he said May 24th would be the beginning of stage three. And in stage three, 100 people or less could gather together as long as they continue practicing social distancing. Now keep in mind, in stage two, the stage we're entering into tomorrow, he did say 65 years old and up should still stay in their homes. Uh, it's still too risky for that demographic, that age group. And, and so in stage three, they lift that restriction. So as a result of listening to everything he said, our elders got together yesterday morning on a Zoom teleconference call, and we decided that it would be best for Southland and the people of Southland to wait until stage three begins, May 24th, to come back together. Now understand, we are really anxious and excited to bring all of our people back together again, and we wanted to do that all at one time, bringing them all together and not having to alienate anyone. And so we're gonna wait until May 24th. We're gonna continue our online worship services until then, online only, I should say. And then even then, on the 24th, we will continue online so that if you are sick, or you're showing symptoms of, of illness, or even if you're just uncomfortable with coming back out in, and being around the public, then we're gonna continue online May 24th, but we also want you to know you're welcome to come here. Now the building's gonna look a lot different inside than you've been used to. Our chairs will be six feet apart, but families can pull those together uh, who are living together if they want to. We'll have overflow set up in the hub and in the cafe. We're gonna do everything we can to accommodate everyone who comes together for celebrating the resurrection on May the 24th, and we hope that you're going to be part of that and that you're just as excited as we are as we look forward to that. There won't be any cafe, no coffee. We're just going to have a time where we get together to praise the Lord and to do our best to follow social distancing and the CDC requirements. We will be asking people to wear masks, except for the people on the platform as they're singing or, or, or I'm preaching, but, we, but everyone else, we're asking you to wear a mask just to protect the other people around you. So that's what we wanted to announce to you this morning. Look forward to May 24th. Continue to pray for us as leaders as we continue to watch the data, watch what is announced by our government, and we try our best to, to, to bring you all together, but also continue serving our community. And speaking of serving our community, that's why I'm excited today to introduce our guest speaker as we emphasize 
our local and global mission. One of our mission partners is One Mission Society, and Danny Beasley is the executive director and, and director of U.S. Missionaries uh, for One Mission Society, which is headquartered right here in Greenwood. Danny and his wife Julie are members of Southland. We enjoy uh, uh, celebrating ministry work with them and supporting them, and I'm so glad he's here to challenge us today. He started his professional career in the business world, with UPS, but felt a call to ministry and went into full-time ministry from there. He and Julie ultimately ended up in Ecuador on the mission field there and serving a term in Ecuador. Now he is back here uh, running local op or national, international operations, and Julie serves as the chief financial officer for OMS as well. I hope you're praying for this morning and the message God's put on his heart to challenge all of us, and I can't wait to hear it. Following the video, Danny Beasley will bring us the message this morning. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, sovereign over all creation. He alone saves. In him, we find unity, the very reason we exist. One Lord. We all have one brief moment to live. Like a mist, we are here and gone in an instant. Whoever wants to save his life must first lose it for the sake of Christ. One life. Our mission is clear. Go into all the world. Proclaim the gospel. Make disciples. We all have one calling. One Mission Society. One Lord, one life, one calling. Amen. Does that not get you excited when you've watched that video and at the end of that video you see these young guys come up out of that water raising their hands in triumphal entry into the kingdom of God by, by that saving grace that comes through Jesus Christ. That is phenomenal. That gets me excited every time I see it. And, and I'm sure that everyone out there that's watching this this morning is ready to jump online to OMS and fill out an application for your service with OMS around the world. Hope some of you might do that at some point. But, but I'm glad you're here with us this morning as we want to talk about missions. We want to talk about, about OMS. We want to talk and encourage you what's the scripture say and how's God speaking to you to engage you in his kingdom work. But before I do that, I want to say thank you as a representative of One Mission Society to Southland Community Church and all that you do in supporting missions around the world. That you're a partner with OMS, with, with other ministries that are serving in parts of the world, as well as the local ministries that are reaching out in the communities here. And thank you. Thank you for being a part of ministry. Thank you for being willing to support local and, and, and foreign missions to exemplify that Acts 1-8 mentality of here in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And on behalf of OMS, I want to say thank you for being willing and being energetic about supporting homeland missionaries who are part of that work in Greenwood that Pastor Steve mentioned that helps facilitate, facilitate ministry around the world. Uh, and also, if I can be bold enough to act as an ambassador for all those other ministries that, that Southland is a part of, that, that we all appreciate your willingness to, to walk with us in ministry. So thank you for that. One Mission Society has been around a long time. We started in 1901, so we're getting ready to celebrate 120 years next year. And OMS is a part of ministry in many parts of the world. 
that we are in 70 plus country and you'll find ministry in, around the world that's being celebrated in like 50 different languages. And so it's phenomenal stuff. So as we start to look, there are many ways to engage with One Mission Society. And, and I forgot to mention this at the first service, but one of those ways is, is the fact that we have ministry through short-term mission trips. You have opportunities through Men for Mission and through Dynamic Women in Missions. And, and you have Every Community for Christ. We have Human Trafficking Prevention Training with Hope 61. There are a number of opportunities in some way, shape, or form that God could use you to connect with One Mission Society as a volunteer, as a, to go on a short-term trip, in some way to grow your understanding and your passion for kingdom work around the world. And uh, so as we go through this message, I'm going to give you some numbers and some things that, that show the impact of the ministry of OMS over the, our last, the last report that we have, which covers the part of 2018 and part of 2019. And, uh, but you can hear some of that, but you can also go to the website at onemissionsociety.org and you'll be able to look at that, that uh, global impact report and get to see where's the impact around the world and what's that like. But this morning, right now, we're going to look at Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 15. We're going to see what the Apostle Paul has to say about missions somewhat as we look at this and how can we be involved. So we're going to look at what this says, what's it saying, so what's it mean, and why is it important for me? Now what do I do with it? How do I apply this to my life? And so as we look, let's read together Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that that you are here with us. Your Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. And we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be speaking to our hearts and ministering to us and is drawing us closer to you in a more intimate relationship. And we pray, Father, that as we look at this scripture this morning, I pray that you would be speaking to us of how you can engage us more intimately and in a deeper walk of kingdom work around the world, but also right here where we are in our local locations. So, Lord, take and use us, and I pray that, that each of us, the desire of our heart, would be open for your service. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to get, look now, and we're going to go through each verse and look at it. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul lays the foundation here that the gospel is for all people. It's for all of us to hear and to respond to have that opportunity. At One Mission Society, our desire is over a 10-year period, starting in 2016 to 2026, is to, have, to share the gospel with 1 billion people. That's a huge number. And sometimes people want to say, how do you reach that number? Really, it's very simple what we talk about. One person at a time. Reach one person that can engage the many around the world. That if you can reach one person... One person can become two, two can become four, four can become eight, and the progression will continue on in multiplication as we, as we desire to give every person we come in contact with the opportunity to hear the gospel. Now, OMS is in, I mentioned, in over 70 countries and 50-plus languages where ministry is taking place, that our desire is to be a part of sharing God's, the good news of Jesus Christ, all across the world. There are some organizations that focus on maybe one section of the world, maybe one people group or one country. But OMS, our desire is to be about sharing the gospel wherever the Lord gives us an opportunity, wherever he opens doors for OMS to be a part of ministry, whether that be residential ministries, whether that be partnering with nationals in certain countries and being a part of ministry. But in some way, shape, or form, we want to be about giving a billion people over the next 10 years and then beyond. We're not going to stop there, but giving those people the opportunity to hear, understand, and respond to the gospel. That's our desire. And I hope that's the desire of your heart as well, because as we look at this, you're going to have opportunity to see how does God want to use me in this plan of giving people the opportunity to hear the gospel so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord may be saved. Verse 14, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? Now, this is interesting. As we start to look at this, we see the word call in both of these scriptures that we're looking at, these first two verses. The significance is the word call implies that if I'm going to call on someone, I believe that they're going to be there to answer. 
If I need help with something at my house that requires some expertise or, or muscle to help move something, uh, something large in my house, I'm going to call someone that I believe can, can help me with that specific purpose or that specific project. I'm not going to call a child to help me move a, a large piece of equipment, most likely. I'm going to call someone who has the expertise or the abilities to do that. So when we look from a scriptural standpoint, when we look at to call on him to believe in him, that we're looking at Jesus He's going to respond. He is who he says he is. That Somehow we have this confidence that if we call out to the name of Christ, that he is going to respond to us, and he has the ability to come into our lives and into our hearts and to make an impact and a transformation to happen in our lives to walk faithfully with him. I love that aspect that that if we're going to call on him, we have confidence in him, that he will be there. We have confidence that he's going to walk with us and help us. And that through that call, we have the opportunity then to believe in him. And that belief is a very active belief, meaning it's something that, that enables us to move forward and to respond in an active way, to be a part of what we hear. And that's where we move into the next part and say that, uh, and how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And this is some interesting part if we're talking about the hearing and the heard in looking at this, that it means the message that's being told, that the people receive and it realize it requires a response meaning that the message that, that people are hearing, they understand the importance and they understand that somehow I need to respond to this and I need to be a part of, of making, a, making a yes or no. Is this important for me? Do I desire this? One of the ministries I was involved with before going to Ecuador was basketball uh, with some inner city guys. And we would open a gym up weekly and play. And, and about midway through the evening of playing basketball, we'd stop and I'd share devotion with the guys. And I'd always share the gospel and give an opportunity to respond. And one of the things I would always share with these guys, that I would say, guys, the most important decision you'll ever make is how you respond to the message of Jesus Christ. It's more important than where you'll work, go to school, who you'll marry, what you will do. That is the one influencing factor that will have an impact on your life forever from that moment on. And I believe that's still true today, that we understand that that message is important. That message has great impact, great influence, and great opportunity to transform our lives and move us forward. So that's my desire as we do that, is we want to give everyone this opportunity to hear and to respond to the gospel. First of all, they have to call on the Lord. They have to be told, they have to hear, I'm sorry, they have to hear about this one that they want to believe in. And then as we move through that, and how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Telling them. This is an interesting concept. In some of your translations, you're going to hear it read in there that it's going to say proclaim or maybe even preach to them. And what I want to make clear on this is looking at that, that this is about everyone being involved and being active. This is not about Pastor Steve or Carrie being up front and preaching from the pulpit to tell people, although that's part of it, and they will do that and they will continue to do that. But this is more about telling someone about that message so that they can hear it. It's not about being a televangelist. It's not about you don't have to be on a street corner proclaiming it. It really has this implication that it could be one-on-one of talking about the aspect of sharing what's going on. And telling can be pretty intimidating. And the times I hear people say, well, I want my life to be a reflection of the gospel. I want to be a, be a living witness by how I live my life. And that is great. James talks about the aspect of faith without works is dead. We want to make sure that our lives are lining up with Scripture and Jesus Christ living and dwelling in us through the power of his Holy Spirit. Nothing wrong with that. And we have the quote that, that from St. Francis of Assisi that talks about the fact that, that preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. There's truth in that, that we want our lives to line up with the Bible, again, that people can see our works. But if you drop down to verse 17 in your Bible here in chapter 10, Paul says, So faith comes from hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ. We need to be able to connect our good works. We need to connect the the visual witness of our lives, of how Christ's living in it, with why we actually live that way. This is the part for me that, that... If we look at, if our lives are a demonstration of the gospel, at some point along the way, there needs to be a proclamation, meaning of of connecting the dots of Jesus Christ coming into my life and changing me, and my life being different, and my actions follow along with what we learn in Scripture and how to live our lives. See, because if we don't do that, what can happen is the 
mentality comes in that, and I'm just going to use my name, for example, that Danny's just a good person. He's a nice guy. And you know what? There are good people out in the world that are dying apart from the gospel, that they help people, they serve people, they do things, but they don't do it in the name of Jesus. And for me, and as we read this, was Paul's talking about, so faith comes from hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ. We need to connect the dots between our transformed lives and how we, how we live and Jesus Christ being the one who transformed us and the reason for our purpose, our service, and what we do in relationship with him. In verse 15, how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? Now, we're going to talk about this, about, about being sent and look in a second. But before I do, I want to pause for a second. I want to encourage you to participate in something that we're doing at OMS. And other mission agencies are doing the same thing. And it's called the Luke 10-2 Prayer Challenge. And so what that is, is this what Jesus is getting ready to send the 72 out, that he's telling them, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord under the harvest to send laborers under his harvest field. And so I'm going to ask you all to set an alarm at 10.02. 10.02 a.m., 10.02 p.m., whether you're Morning, night, does not matter when it is, but set an alarm, and when that alarm goes off, I'm going to ask you to come alongside what we're doing at OMS and praying for the Lord to raise up more laborers under his harvest field. Because no matter what is going on in the world, the harvest is plentiful. As a matter of fact, with what's happening with this virus in this day and age, people are looking for something, a reason. They're looking for hope. They're looking for something to believe in that's greater than what's impacting our world. If anything, through a crisis is when the harvest is even more plentiful. There's more opportunity to share. So I want to invite you to come alongside and pray with OMS about missionaries, about the Lord raising up labors under his harvest field. Now, I will share that someone asked me the question, how many are you praying for? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50? And this really wasn't trying to be have a pious answer in my part, but I said, you know what? I don't have a number in my head. I'm asking the Lord to provide a continual supply of missionaries to OMS so that we may mobilize them, we may equip them, we may train them, and we may send them out for kingdom work around the world. So I don't want to ask just for 10 and stop there. I want to keep going. I want a continual supply of new missionaries being sent around the world so that we can be a part of equipping at one mission society, equipping and training the nationals to reach their own. It's not about sending missionaries from North America to reach the world. It's about sending missionaries who are equipped to make disciple makers and that those disciple makers will plant worshiping groups. Those worshiping groups then will have more leaders in them. And out of all of that, the disciples, the worshiping groups, and the leaders becomes more opportunities for missional movements, meaning that we have people from other parts of the world who are being sent out as missionaries to reach people as well. That's our heart's desire in doing that in that sending part. So if you would come along with us and pray that, that prayer of Luke 10 too, set that alarm and partner with that. I would be greatly appreciative of that. But we look at this as that someone who's being sent, that if someone is sent, that means they have a message to share. And somehow, if we want to say they've been commissioned, and, and we think of sending, we think of an organization like OMS, that we do. Our desire is to send more missionaries around the world. But, and we can look back at, at the Apostle Paul is writing this in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are sent out by the church at Antioch. So there's kind of this corporate sending of the church at Antioch doing that with Paul and Barnabas. That's who OMS is. We're about this corporate sending that we want to recruit. We partner with many churches and equipping missionaries and sending them around the world and then us providing the support and the care for them as well. But I believe there's more to that than this because if we're looking at this scripture, Paul is really making this a personal aspect. The personal salvation is for everyone. So we think about, okay, how can I be sent? What does that mean for me as an individual if I don't connect with a church to send me or an organization to send me? Well, I kind of equate this in the personal sense along with the great commandment and the great commission. That those are instructions given to us. The great commandment, we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love our neighbors as ourself. It's not an option for us as believers in Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. That the love of Christ that's in us wells up in us and flows out. And that's how we respond to the love of Christ. By what he's already working in us. The Great Commission is go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. It doesn't mean you have to go across the world, but as you go, you need to be a part about sharing the gospel and pouring into people so they may learn. And then hopefully the Lord open up the door that you have a specific person or people that you can invest in that they may grow 
and then in turn make disciples and invest in others in doing that. That's a desire in that. So what's it mean to be sent? It could be corporately, meaning going with an organization. It could be the fact that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are sent, meaning you have the responsibility. You've been saved for service, and that service, the main priority in that is sharing the good news about Jesus Christ with others. So sending could be a corporate thing. Sending could be a part of the fact that, that you are commissioned for ministry by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ to share what he's done in your heart. And, and as we talk about that sending and that telling, they, they somewhat go together in looking at that. And I had someone ask me, invite me early on in my walk of faith to say, hey, come with me. We're going to do some street ministry and ministering to people. And I'm like, whoa, wait a second here. I don't know if I signed up for that. And I said, I don't know the Bible. I can't quote the Bible to them. I can't talk about verses. I can't do this because I don't know enough yet. So let me learn. When I learn and I feel comfortable with it, then I'll come out with you. I'd actually never made it out with that person. But what he shared with me was something that was profound that's always stuck with me. That he said that you could find someone who could argue every scripture in the Bible with you. Anything you put, they can counter it some way and come up with some argument. But the thing that they can't do and they can't argue is a transformation that's happened in your heart. What Jesus Christ has done through the power of his Holy Spirit in transforming you from someone who was lost to someone who's been saved, to someone who's walking in an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. They can't take that away. Satan cannot rob you of that transformation. And that's what we have to tell and what we have to share. And also when we look about that, about, about that sending and that telling aspect, that, that we want to make sure that that. We don't lose sight of what Paul's doing, telling us here. Oh, the, the gospel is important. The end result is what we look at, uh, meaning someone believing in Christ. Let's go on here as we, as we look at this a little bit farther. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. I don't know about you, but for the most part in summer, You'll never catch me wearing open-toed sandals. I don't know why. Maybe I have something about feet. I don't want people seeing my feet. And we talk about how beautiful are the feet, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news in doing that. That that word beautiful, it, it, it can't have a, a, a significance of aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing to the eyes. But the Greek word that's used here has this, this intent on timing, meaning that, that the, the timing, the, the time is ripe. For the moment of the message. And what Paul is referring to, he's actually quoting back to Isaiah 52, where they're talking about the messengers. And that messenger was someone who was bringing the message of hope and peace that the captivity, that the Babylon captivity was ending and people would be returning back to Jerusalem. So that they were sharing this, it, these dirty, callous feet that were making that journey from Babylon back to, back to Jerusalem to give this, proclaim this message. It wasn't about the aesthetically pleasing part. It was about the message of hope that the messenger was bringing, the message of hope that captivity in Babylon was over, that, that, that we can proclaim that same message of hope as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that your feet can be beautiful, not because of what they're dressed in, but from the fact of the message that you are bringing, that the hope we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at this scripture and we put these things together, I love what Paul's doing, that Paul's taking something here and, and he's not letting us lose sight of the why or the end result that we're doing. And that's so people can hear and understand and respond to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, as a mission organization, it might be easy for us or even for all of us to sit and think, well, wait a second, let's jump back to the, his ending part is generally our beginning part. We want to focus on the sending so someone could go and tell, so people can hear, and then people can believe and call on his name. Nothing wrong with that, but we don't want to lose sight of why we do all that. The end result is that people may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and may believe in him and walk with him. They'll call on his name because they believe he will listen, that he will be there. That's powerful messages. When we look at this, there's very much the aspect that, that Paul is putting this as an individual aspect for us. And just like we have the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, and I'm sure you've heard it preached and people use this clever saying that those aren't just great suggestions. For the follower of Jesus Christ, these are part of who we are. 
And I believe Paul is saying something and doing something here with us and saying, hey, how can you be involved? How can you participate? What's the Lord calling you to do? Because there are opportunities for us here to put our faith into action. Because I said, you're saved for service. We're not saved to be spectators. That we are, God's plan is really to use his people, us, to be the tools and the instruments that share that good news, to share that message so that we can tell people. So we are saved to participate in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ by telling people that Jesus Christ reigns. He's Lord of my life, and he can be Lord of yours as well. Let me tell you how. Let me share with you about what that says. So Paul's being very intentional here, not letting us forget the end result is why we do this, why OMS wants to recruit, wants to mobilize, and wants to prepare people and train them and equip them so that we can send them off well-prepared to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we're about. That's what we want to do. So my question is, as we start to look at this, how can God use you? How does your story of what God's done in your life intersect with his and the people he's put in your life? And those opportunities of faithful obedience God can magnify and do some great things. But I'm going to share a couple of stories with you that, that give a little example of this. That in Ecuador, I had the opportunity to preach out in the Shuar communities with the indigenous Shuar in the southern Amazon jungle. This first time in this one community is the first time I visited with the pastor we worked with. And he asked me to preach an evangelistic service right before Easter. And as I preached, I had a young man staring at me the whole time, really with a hard look on his face. And, uh, uh, and I was a little nervous thinking, why is this guy staring at me so intently as he was looking at me? He had his arms crossed, and this was just under an awning, just under a, like a, this wooden shack. He was just under a porch type thing. And, and I couldn't take my eyes off. Every time I panned around with the 15 people or so that were there, I kept locking eyes with his name. His name was Clever. I never would have thought that he would respond, but when I gave the invitation to respond to the gospel, he didn't hesitate, and he responded. He wanted to accept Jesus Christ into his life, and he did. Six months later, because this was in the same year that when we were asked to come back and serve at headquarters, my last visit to that community for Julie and I both was six months after that. In those six months, he didn't tell us this, but the leader of the community came to us and said, hey, have you heard what Clever's been doing? And we said no, because he was very humble. He, wouldn't, he wasn't going to look like he was bragging on himself. But he said, clever, since he accepted Christ, he's led his whole family to the Lord. And not only has he led, led his whole family to the Lord, he had a little wooden canoe that, uh, that had a, a motor on it that looked like a weed eater with a propeller at the end of the shaft on it. He had taken that canoe and went up and down the river to the other Shuar communities that were scattered up and down the river and shared the gospel with people, and 11 other people at that time frame had accepted Jesus as their Lord because they were doing that. You know what? Clever didn't have any theological training. Clever had the gospel message shared with him. The pastor we partnered with would still go back once a week and invest in him and do this. And technology is so great that we can sit here and have this message in this way right now virtually. I got a call from Clever from the jungle through a WhatsApp phone call. This was probably six, seven months ago that Clever called to let me know that one of those communities he went to called Narvaez, that he was actually leading the church in that community now. That he was leading folks, discipling them and mentoring them and proclaiming the good news of Jesus so that they may learn and grow and do the same thing that he was doing. I don't say that to pat myself on the back either. All that is is a willingness to be responsive to what God's calling you to do. That he's saying, will you follow me? Will you be obedient? Where's your role in this? As we look at this, there, I could tell you stories from around the world of people's lives who've been transformed. I want to give one more before, before we kind of wind this up somewhat. But in one of our mission fields, there was a person who responded to the gospel, and they ended up starting a house church in their community. And when they started that house church, the government came to them and the police came to them and told them they had 30 days to stop meeting in that home. If they didn't stop meeting in that home, they were going to tear the house down. 30 days came. They were still having their house church and meeting in that home. 31 days came, they tore the house down, and that person had nowhere to live. That person went and found another place to live, started another house church. 
That's the transforming power of the gospel of what we're talking about here. That for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not saved to be a spectator, but saved to be active and vibrant part of the faith community and proclaiming the good news of Jesus. What's he asking of you today? As we look at this today and we look at this message and we can look at every part there. For verse 13, it talks about the seeker. When we get into verse 14 and 15, he's really talking to the believer here at this point in time. So as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, what's he calling us to? For others who are out there, you may be listening and being, uh, being a part of this service online right now. You may be in that first category of seekers. You may be in that position of saying, is God real? What is out there for me right now? Maybe you need to call in the name of the Lord. Maybe you need to be a part of saying, Jesus, I'm here. Jesus, help me. And then from the other part, we go down to the verse 14 and on through the rest of that scripture. We may need to be a part of the telling. We may know someone who needs to hear the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. He may be asking us to step out in faith and tell someone so that we can have a part in a participatory part of sharing the good news of Jesus. He may be calling us to be about sending, whether that be us being sent by someone else, or he may be calling us to be a part of sending more missionaries out, whether that's corporately by the church or whether that you as an individual to partner with missionaries and help financially support them or help them with prayer support and help them with other ways. There are many ways to be a part of sending and what that looks like. And when you're a part of that sending, there's great impact that can happen. The impact that can happen, just like I shared about Clever, with the people that he had led to the Christ and it led to Christ within a six-month span, you could be a part of sending people out that has that multiplication impact that I shared about as you reach one and it multiplies and reach the many, up to the hundreds of thousands in that last year, the reporting that OMS has is somewhere close to 400,000, about 390,000, and about 87,000 worshiping groups happening and more being added on a regular basis on things. How can you be a part of that and what is God calling you to do? to participate with him in his message of hope to the world. My prayer is that, that uh, if the Lord is speaking to your heart, you'd be willing to respond to that. My prayer is that if you respond, if the Lord is speaking to you and you're willing to say, yes, Lord, that you would tell someone and let them know. Because Satan's a good thief. If we don't put a voice to what the Lord's doing in our heart, he wants to rob what the Lord's doing. He wants to steal and to kill and destroy. So I want to encourage you as you read this, as you look at this, and we see what is God doing? What's he calling me to? Ask him, seek him. And I believe what it says, that if there's a call, if there's calling on the Lord, I have a confidence that he'll respond. I have a confidence that he will be there. So let's pray together. And as the worship team gets ready to come up and lead us in a final song, seek the Lord through this prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful that we can trust you. God, I'm so thankful that you first loved me and drawn that you were calling me to you. And by your love, I was able to respond. And that's the testimony of the believer. Lord Jesus, that you make an impact on lives, you transform lives, Lord, and then you equip us, you send us, you allow us to be a part of your plan of sharing the good news around the world. And most importantly, sharing the good news right where we are, where you have us in whatever part of the world that we're in. So Lord Jesus, I pray that, that whatever was said in here, most importantly, I pray that you would just take the words of the scripture to impress upon people's heart where you're calling them to participate and to be. Whether it's the seeker that needs to call on you, whether it's the other parts about going, telling, sending. Lord, use us for your glory and for your ministry. Jesus, we love you, and we are so thankful of your presence here with us. Now draw us to you. In Jesus' name, amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son and whosoever believes will not perish they shall die eternal life the 
I want to thank Danny. I want to thank Danny so much for that message this morning to remind me that I'm not a spectator in this mission. I am an absolute participant, a servant in this mission. You know that we've been talking a lot about how we're all in this together with the COVID-19 virus. And, and you need to know we're all in this mission together. All of us are a part of what God is doing in our community and around the world. We are so grateful for our mission partners, but that's who they are, partners. That means we have a relationship with them. If you'd like to learn more about Southland's mission partners, just go to our website, southlandchurch.org, and you can click on missions. You'll find all of the mission partners there, and you can go to their websites through those links and find out what God is doing through them and, and, and I also want you to capture another part of what Danny said this morning, is that your story is so important to the mission. 
and, and telling your story of why you believe and, and how Jesus has blessed your life is so important to other people who are, are, are feeling hopeless and wandering and who are afraid. And finding someone like you who could tell your story about loving Christ and the hope he gives could make the difference in their eternity, but really in their life right now. So I hope you will do that and, and join me in praying in, in, in supporting our missionary partners. The thing we do here at Southland is called Faith Promise. We ask everyone to consider what God would want them to give up, up, on, up on top of their giving to our church for mission ministry. And, and we'd love it if you would um, continue to give toward your faith promise that you made last November. But if you haven't made one yet, we'd love for you to give to our mission ministry, to pray for our mission ministry, and to even serve in the midst of our mission ministry. So thanks for the way you're supporting us, and thanks for all you're doing to bring Jesus' love around the world. Now, I, I want to remind you, May 24th, that's the date that we're praying toward, but we'll be here next week celebrating Mother's Day, and so we hope you'll join us in both the 9 or the, uh, the well at 11 o'clock and, uh, and plan on telling some people about it as well, and then, and then we look forward to that day when we'll all be back here together celebrating the resurrection. We're going to send you more information about that on social media, email, mail. We'll send out some videos, so be watching for all of that so you can capture the details. Now, before you go this morning, I hope you'll stick around for just a, another minute as Jeff Griffith wants to give you a, just a little bit more information on how you can respond to everything that you've heard today. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for the calling that Danny told us about this morning that you've placed upon all of us to go and make followers of Jesus. Use us to that end in every way that we can, through prayer, through giving, through telling our story. Show us how we can be part of this mission. And we'll do it so you get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great day today and a great week ahead. Thanks a lot for being at Southland today. I hope you enjoyed the service and were encouraged by the worship and Danny's message. We really want to do everything we can to help our community and the rest of the world know about Jesus. I'm glad that Danny reminded me to make sure I stay engaged in that mission. As always, if you have a question or comment about the message, you can email Danny at the address on your screen. You can also find out more about One Mission Society at their website, onemissionsociety.org. Before you go, I want to remind you that Southland continues to pray daily for anyone who asks. So if you have a specific prayer request, use the comment section on Facebook or click the prayer request button on the website and let our prayer teams know. Oh, and one more thing, if you'd like to give an offering to Southland, use any of the formats that are now on your screen. Text give, click give on the website, or mail in a check to the church office. Your faithful giving makes all of this possible. Thank you so much for your generous support of our ministry. And thanks again for being here. Next week, Pastor Steve will begin a series called Insta Family, where whether you're single, married, or raising a house full of kids, the messages will definitely have something for you. Be sure to watch for email and social media updates on staying connected with Southland Services and tell your friends, as always, to join you. Have a great week.